On the flight deck, listeners are manning up for the podcast launch. It's time for all unnecessary shows to clear the airwaves. You're listening to The Hangar Bay, a podcast dedicated to the latest military flight simulation and hardware news. From developers to the community and everything in between, The Hangar Bay will get you squared away. Welcome down to The Hangar Bay, your source for the latest news that every military flight simulation pilot can use for the week of January 27th, 2024. I'm your host, Sumanji, and I'm so glad you could join us for what is the very first episode of The Hangar Bay and also my very first podcast. I've been a fan of military flight sims for about 30 years now, dating back to uh, U.S. Navy fighters on DOS all the way back in 1994. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, But separately, I've also been a fan of podcasts for 20 years, listening to my first show back in 2005. And I say that because combining these two passions is something I've wanted to do for a long time now. You know, we're so fortunate to have so many wonderful content creators in the military flight simulation community. From YouTube to Twitch and streaming to traditional blogs, so many people have all those bases covered, but podcasts are the one form of content I think we're really lacking. So my goal for this show is to give you something that you can take with you and stay up to date on this wonderful hobby of ours while you go about your busy week. Having said that, I'm incredibly excited to be bringing you episode one of the show today. And since it is the very first episode, I hope you're going to bear with me. I want to go over a few administrative details regarding the content of the show and what you can expect to hear from me each week. So the Hangar Bay is intended to be a celebration of all aspects of military flight simulation. On this show, we're going to cover the simulations themselves and the developers who make them. We're also going to cover the hardware we use to fly them, from throttles and joysticks to rudder pedals and even custom cockpit additions. And then finally, we're going to cover the community itself, from tutorials and user missions to simple DIY projects. If you use it before, during, or after a virtual flight, I want to cover it on this show. And although I'm currently the only host on this show, I'm going to use the word we a lot, because in many ways I want this to be the community show. The military flight simulation community is full of incredibly talented people who give so much of their time to make the experience better for those around them. I know you probably have associated with these people yourselves, whether it's in your squadrons, on multiplayer servers, or even on Hoggit on Reddit. I want to highlight these people in some small way each and every week. The way in which I'm going to do that, the formatting of the show, is intended to be the same each and every week. I'll start with a very brief rundown of the latest news for those of you who are short on time. You know, think of this as the TLDR version. And then we'll begin the episode in full covering developer and third-party news, hardware news, and then finally community news. Once that's complete, we'll move on to highlight community creations via the user content of the week segment, as well as the SimPit spotlight. And then finally, we'll end with listener questions, listener questions and feedback, uh, which hopefully you guys will provide as the weeks move along. Okay, so now that I bored you with all the details, I set up what the show is going to be like, let's go ahead and get started today with the flyby. All right, the the flyby highlights this week's news in 60 seconds or less, hopefully. All right, this week, Heat Blur dropped another amazing F4E trailer. Really, you should go check it out. Feels like the release of this module is very, very close. Keep an eye out. DCS is planning to eliminate the stable and open beta branches in the next patch, moving to a unified version of the game. IL-2 Sturmovic devs had a community chat last week and teased carrier operations in their next project, and potentially a World War II Pacific theater setting at some point in the future. Patch 5.202 for IL-2 is due in the first half of February, and will bring some welcome changes to make binding controls much, much easier. Seems like they're hinting at the DCS system, which I welcome. Microprose's B-17 Flying Fortress, the Mighty 8 Redux, is available in early access on GOG and Steam, but early impressions are mixed, so you might want to keep an eye out before you make a purchase. Windwing rudder pedals go on sale on January 30th at 9 a.m. UTC plus 8. That's 8 p.m. on the 29th of January Eastern Standard Time here in the U.S. and 1 a.m. at GMT. And finally, TacView updated to add the Sinai map for DCS. So that's all we got for the flyby, but hopefully you'll stick around for the rest of this week's show. Let's move on over to developer news. Hey everyone, Wags here. Starting things off with this week's developer news, let's focus on the old stuff first and start with IL-2 Sturmovic, Great Battles. 
So last week, as I hinted at in the flyby, they had their third episode of The Briefing Room. On these episodes, if you haven't been paying attention, I've been hosted by the producer as well as the historical contents consultants and mission designers of the simulation. Uh, the, I have a video link in the show notes if you want to find that later after the show, but I've gone ahead and pulled a few of the key notes that I thought were most interesting and I thought I'd share with them. As I alluded to earlier in the flyby as well, carrier operations were the major ticket that stood out to me. Uh, I'm a huge fan of naval aviation, given my background, so anything that can add to the historical carrier operations beyond the modern day that we see in DCS, I'm a huge fan of. The exact quote was, their new management strategy is allowing them to work on that, it being carrier operations, and not just for their next project, but as part of a project they're currently working on right now. So in many ways, this developer Q&A hinted at two separate projects, what they're working on, a short-term and a long-term, potentially short-term being Korea. We've been seeing that hinted at a lot. And then the longer-term one potentially being a future IL-2 Sturmovic edition set in the Pacific Theater. I I'd love to see both of them, so hopefully we get more news about that in the future. Second issue teased was a question specifically related to, are there plans to expand the pilot RPG aspect of the simulation? The devs went on to say that yes, their plans are to give players more control over the squadron. So players will go all the way to becoming regimental level officers. It's the classic career with additional functions. So you'll be able to request ammo, fuel from HQ, play a role with more administrative activities beyond just the immediate squadron level. The third question I pulled out was, can ground units be visually reworked? So the developer said that all 3D content for the new project is being designed from scratch, including ground units. They did go on to say that they didn't feel it was feasible given their current production cycle to go back and do that for previous or existing projects. So unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to leverage much of this a, a new content, at least from a graphical standpoint, in the current IL-2 series. But hopefully we see some huge improvements with the new project coming our way. The next question was, will you make the B-25 and B-26 player flyable? I know this has been something that I've personally been wanting to see in the IL-2 series for a long time. Uh, so as it relates to IL-2 great battles, the immediate answer was the B-26 is a massive task, so that doesn't look feasible. But the B-25 might be a better option. The team went on to hint that they really have... They think it would be a perfect setting for the Pacific Theater operations. So there's a good chance that if we do see that come out uh, from the developers in the future, the B-25 would be one of the flyable planes in that theater someday. So I don't know if I caveat that enough. Long story short, doesn't look like we'll see anything in the immediate future, but for future projects, definitely seems something they're interested in doing. Next question was, is a clickable cockpit plan for a new project? And they didn't specifically mention DCS by name, but they did go out of their way to say that when you introduce clickable cockpits, you're significantly increasing the workload and that the price in the market has already been set by those who do build them, aka DCS. So then they asked a question for the community. Would the community be willing to pay that cost for clickable planes if that meant increasing on a per aircraft basis? So if you have 10 aircraft with clickable cockpits, are you going to be willing to pay 10 times the price to support that? What a better alternative to be able to run a crowdsourcing campaign for pro versions of the aircraft? You know, they didn't really provide the community with any exact answers here, really just walking us through their decision-making process as it relates to this question. My takeaway was it doesn't seem to be something they really have any intent on doing, but it was interesting to get a little bit more insight into where they're, where they're looking at clickable cockpits from. And then finally, the, the question that I thought was very intriguing was, where do you think you are at in terms of developing the next project? I wasn't really expecting an a, a specific answer, but they said 40%. Now, without knowing when they actually started that project, it's hard to extrapolate that forward to when they might finish, but there you go. Tabulated some more notes. Those will be in the podcast notes available on the hangarbay.pod.com if you'd like to see them, as well as the video podcast version of this, which will be on Spotify and YouTube. So you can always follow along with my show notes or review them after you're done listening. And in this particular case, you can find more on the developer uh, roundtable there. Also on the IL-2 Sturmovic front, this week, January 26, we got their latest developer diaries, number 356. And the long short of it was they teased that the next patch is coming in the first half of February. 
with that patch, we're looking at receiving two new aircraft, the long fuselage option of the Romanian IAR-80, and then the British Spitfire 9C will be released. They did detail a few other additional improvements, specifically uh, changes to the P-47 and P-40 flight model are in progress. They won't make this patch, but they are on their way. A new mission type will be added in this patch uh, regarding defending a friendly airfield from an enemy raid. And then finally, the, the item I'm most looking forward to about this patch is input system changes. I teased this in the flyby, but what they spell out is it's going to be po it, the, I, the process of assigning hardware inputs or I should say in-game inputs to your hardware should be a lot easier going forward. So searching for inputs will no longer be an issue. If you press the desired input or switch or button, it'll go right to that on your uh, bindings. Alternatively, if you move the control axis, you'll it'll pop right up for you. And then finally, if you are searching for a command, you can just type in the name of it and it'll take you to it directly. Should make the binding process much, much easier. Of course, we'll have to wait and see what it looks like in game. But anything that can make the input assignment process easier in IL-2, I'm a huge fan of. So that wraps things up from a World War II standpoint. Let's pivot back to the modern day and talk about DCS. Uh, I'm a week late in talking about this, and some of you might have seen it already, but last Friday's newsletter, so the 19th of January, Eagle Dynamics gave a quick update on the F-100D Super Saver development in progress by Grinelli Designs. Now, the team over at Grinelli put together a really cool video on YouTube, which I encourage you to check out. Essentially, they had the opportunity to scan multiple Super Savers across the country in the United States to get some very detailed 3D scans, which should go a long way to making the cockpit and the aircraft look really amazing in-game. And then in particular, they also had the opportunity to see the last functional version of the F-100 take flight. So they got ground noise recordings, airborne recordings, airborne footage. Long story short, they're doing an incredible amount of research on this aircraft, and it looks like they're really going to do a good job of putting this into the game, and progress continues on what will hopefully be a great module. They also, if you ever have a chance to go check out their website, they always have a progress tracker going along as to how far they are with art and coding and then the overall progress of the aircraft. Right now, they list it as 53% complete, but as with uh, IL-2 earlier, you know, take that percentage for what you will. That doesn't actually attribute itself to an end date, but at least progress is being made. All right, this week's news with the DCS Weekly Newsletter for the 26th of January. The biggest change of all DCS news this week, in my opinion, is what I tease in the flyby of the unified release. DCS is merging the stable and open beta builds. You know, this is something that people in the community have been talking about, asking about for a long while. I'm sure there's a variety of community members who have varying thoughts. Overall, I think this is a fantastic change for the community. What this means, if you're not aware, is DCS is currently operating on two different branches. The open beta is more, if you want to think of it, as a public test realm. It's the branch of DCS that really receives the updates first, and essentially the community serve as quote-unquote beta testers, if you will. But that's where the products arrive first, so when the new uh, modules, campaigns, things of that nature hit the market, you see it there first. In theory, the, the plan has been once that's tested and the bugs are all ironed out, gets pushed over to the stable branch. But what I, I, often happens here, in my opinion, is this just serves to segment the community. New players who come into the game don't know about these branches. They fire up multiplayer. There's no servers. Where is everybody? It's because they're all playing on the open branch. Open beta build, excuse me. I think by combining this, it's going to streamline things for onboarding new players. It's going to reduce population fragmentation within the community. And it's going to ensure everybody gets access to all the good stuff at the same time. So... Obviously, this remains to be seen what the full impact is. I'm hopeful. I'm positive that thinking this could be a very good thing for the community. So I'm very excited to see Eagle Dynamics do this. Pivoting away from Eagle Dynamics themselves and over to the third parties, Heatboard dropped a trailer for the new F4E on Friday night that essentially kind of stole the thunder, even though I still like that unified release news. This is a fantastic four minute and 20 second trailer showing off Heapor's F4E wild wish weasel mission capabilities of the aircraft. If you haven't seen this, it's a fantastic video. Check it out. Adrian Carpazzo, Caparzo, excuse me, hopefully I said that right. He's created some amazing DCS videos in the past and, and this one is no exception. 
uh, if anything, it just can't, gets me even more fired up about this module. I already have it pre-ordered. I'm sure like many of you do. Uh, and Heapboard just never fails to deliver. So if, if this even achieves half of what they achieved with the F14, I think we're really going to be set for a solid edition. And honestly, from where this video is at, I wouldn't be surprised if we see if the release date for this aircraft is in weeks, maybe a month or two, rather than uh, quarter two or quarter three of this year. Beyond the video, the team also teased a 375-page work-in-progress version of the manual for you to read. So those of you who like to get buried in all the minutia of the aircraft or dig in through the manuals, you're going to have a real treat here because what Heapware has put together with this manual is pretty impressive. Uh, the biggest takeaway for me is that the manual is open source. So they're hosting it on GitHub which may not mean much to those of you who aren't familiar with the software programming world. But for those of you who understand the, the, what this enables is really a, a crowdsourcing, of you will, of community knowledge regarding this aircraft. So Heapboard's already set the standard pretty high, putting out a lot of details about, details about the aircraft. But as the community's knowledge of this aircraft grows and continues, we're going to be able to feed that knowledge directly into the manual itself. And why is that important? Well, Heapboard in the first few pages teases some really incredible things about this aircraft. Specifically, you're gonna be able to pull up this manual in game while in flight. You click a switch, the manual pops open, boom, you toggle a switch in the aircraft, it's gonna take you right to that chapter, explain that switch, explain that system. I mean, the possibilities for this are just amazing and could really revolutionize how we learn aircraft in DCS. Beyond that, some of the other features that Heapboard teases in the manual about the F4E, which I thought were really cool, are the ability to write on your canopy. I think we've already seen that in one of the trailers, but I can't wait to see that in action. And then also an interactive crew chief. So, you know, Heapboard has long been known to kind of push the boundaries of what's possible in DCS with, with their addition of the Rio and the F14 and Jester, which makes this comeback, I'm, I'm sure, in the F4E here. But th this just goes to show they're continuing to do that and continuing to add to additions to the game. And I just couldn't be more excited. So hopefully we'll be seeing this aircraft soon. And not to be outdone on the third party news uh, is Razbam, who details some updates on their upcoming MiG-23 MLA. So this news comes to us from their Discord. So if you're not a member there, be sure to get and you're interested in Razbam products, be sure to get signed up there. But they go uh, to detail a few pieces of news. First is that the external model for the aircraft is 90% complete. So that, that's pretty impressive progress. And they show a screenshot there to also detail what you're seeing. But they said the work on the final elements, the visual damage model, and the uh, leveries remain. But overall, external model almost complete. Internally, the cockpit's at about 70% with about 95% of the animations done. So we're seeing a lot of significant progress in terms of the modeling department. They also, not to be outdone by Heapler's work with the manual, also stated that their manual draft is in an advanced state, and then they're looking into if they can share an advanced copy of it once it's in a more completed state. And then finally, initial testing of the aircraft in game has already started. So it wouldn't surprise me if Razbam's going out of their way in 2023 for to make 2024 the year of the MiG-23, just like 2023 was the year of the F-15E. And I'm telling you, if for the Red 4 fans out there, if you can get a MiG-23 and Eagle Dynamics comes through with the MiG-29A in 2024, it's going to be quite a year for you guys. I say you guys because I'll be honest, I don't throw stones at me or send me hate mail, but I'm, I'm not a big Red 4 guy. I'm the Blue 4 is where it's at. Okay, so that wraps things up with DCS. Uh, we're going to move over to a game that I'm going to include in the military flight simulation uh, umbrella, or under the umbrella, I should say, and that's a new one from Microprose. Well, should, should I say new? Let's, let's say it's a redux, because that's in the title. B-17 Flying Fortress, the Mighty Eighth Redux, is released to early access. So, for those of you who are not aware, uh, this was a title released almost 24 years ago, and it's back. So, Microprose... Well-timed, I should say, with Masters of the Air debuting on Apple TV this week, is releasing this Redux version into early access on Steam and good old games. It's currently 10% off, uh, which makes it $13 and roughly 50 cents here in the United States. But I, I got to tell you, it's off to a rocky start. I was looking to pick this up day one, so that would have been last night when it debuted on Steam. And, you know, 
take 24-hour reviews for what they are, but eh, it's looking a little touchy out there. It's currently got a mixed review of about only 50% of the folks recommending it, with the common complaints seem to be it. When it says early access, it is very early access. A lot of people think, commented along the lines of they did enough to kind of update the game to make it run on your modern system, and, and so far, that's about it. So the long and short of it is it still feels very old. So any of the controls you used to use, as awkward as they are, well, they're still pretty awkward. You know, I'll, have, I'll probably still check this out for myself because I, I love this game back in the day, and I'd love to dig into it some more on a modern system. But this might be one to wait on if you're a little on the fence. But I should probably backtrack and say for those of you who don't know much about this game, it's focused on the 10-man crew around the B-17, so flying missions over Europe in World War II, and it's not your traditional flight simulator in the sense where you're hopping in and manipulating all the co controls. It's more of a strategic element to it. Almost, I don't want to say RPG, RPG, but something along those lines. You know, in terms of Microprose's own words, it's a flight sim with a focus on crew management. So if, if you want a game where you can dig your teeth into, but then still sit back and relax and see the outcomes of your planning, then this might be your cup of tea. So anyway, links to the game on Steam, as well as some pictures of in-development screenshots can be found on the blog, including a trailer. So check out the show notes for the show, and you'll see more there. On a final Microprose note, they also coincided the release of the Redux version into Early Access with their first development blog and work-in-progress footage from the Mighty 8th VR. So if you haven't been tracking this, this is a game purely set in the virtual reality space. <clears throat> in the short video they had detailing some of the work in progress footage, they basically input you in a Jeep, they drive out to the flight line, circle around the B-17 with the engines running, and then kind of park the car. So more of that elephant walk to the runway, if you will. No gameplay footage beyond that. But it allowed you to see what some of the brief interactions with the vehicle look like. So they're they're really making it pretty detailed. So in order to operate the Jeep, you need to grab the parking brake, release it, grab the gear, put in the vehicle into gear. Then you can hold the triggers on your joysticks there and accelerate the vehicle, drive it out to the flight line. I mean, anyway, as much as you can get from a two-minute work-in-progress video, I was pretty excited. And I say that as someone who does not own a virtual reality headset. But if this is just a small glimpse of what they might be able to do in the cockpit, it's something to be excited about. So the link to that is also in the blog notes. Check it out on Steam. Follow the developer in the future, and we'll see where we get. We're probably talking two to three years down the road, but it's one to keep an eye on. All right, that wraps up developer news. So let's shift our focus over to the hardware side of the house. Flight controls. Flight controls. So it's been a pretty big week in hardware, busy week, excuse me, in hardware news. The first thing we'll touch on is WinWing. For those of you who don't follow WinWing, they're a hardware manufacturer based out of China. Uh, it's really specialized in a lot of uh, aircraft-specific gear. So, But one of the newest additions they have coming our way is a set of rudder pedals. So the rudder pedals are set to be available for pre-order on January 30th at 9 a.m. UTC plus 8. So that's Beijing time, I believe. And if I did my conversions right, that puts it on 8 p.m. on the 29th of January, Eastern Standard Time. So that'll be Monday night. And it'll be Tuesday at 1 a.m. GMT for you folks across the pond. So pricing-wise, these rudder pedals, if you just want the standard edition, are going to debut at $290 US. The damper will be an extra $40. But if you buy them together, it'll put you at, so that puts you at about $330 US for the full set. Now, the big selling point of the damper is it's supposed to be minimizing movements on the rudder pedals, but the key thing is if you fly the rotary wing aircraft, the helos, pop out that spring, the damper offers you a no return to center mode. So you basically have your hydraulic action play there, set the pedals where you want them, and they won't move. So, and then finally, the third option that they're teasing, which makes it unique to these pedals, is you got the fixed wing element, you got the rotary wing element. They also tease a ground vehicle driving mode. So if you were looking for one set of pedals that can do it all, this might be your cup of tea. They also tease a variety of other features, such as mounting hole options, anti-slip pads. They're claiming that this is the best set of pedals you can get for your desk if you don't want to worry about them sliding all over the floor. So... We'll see. I haven't had any early reviews on this, and I, I'm undecided if I'm going to pick this one up myself. But as soon as we get to see a review, I'll plop it in uh, the show notes or even discuss it in future weeks, and we'll see what folks have to say. 
That said, I do own a variety of Winwing hardware already, from throttles to joysticks, and I've been really happy with it, so I do recommend their gear, so I have no reason to doubt that this will be also a pretty solid product. Shifting over to Burple, so going over to Europe now, Burple is set to announce that they've uh, already started shipping, shipping <laughs> their Apache grips and collective counterweights. So for those of you who pre-ordered last fall, well, be looking in the mail for your shipping notice. It's coming your way. The first customers have already received their shipping notice. Uh, note, I'm excitedly awaiting mine, Verbal. You can send that whenever you want. Uh, and the collective counterweights should be coming out your way pretty soon. Pricing, for those of you who didn't pre-order, for the Apache Collective Grip, it's about $290 US, which puts it at about 270 euros. The collective counterweight, which should allow you to make more fine adjustments on your uh, uh, collective, the pricing for that, if you haven't already ordered it, is $35 US or 30 euros. And then finally, the third piece of equipment that Verpal debuted and it's now available for purchase is their own rudder pedal damping upgrade kit. So we teased, or I sorry, I shouldn't say, I mentioned that Winwing is also selling their damper. Well, if you have some Verpal pedals, they're selling their own version of that now too. They advertise that this is going to help you improve your accuracy and precision and then smooth out movements and would also allow you to have that no return to center mode we were talking about earlier with helicopters. Their damper is gonna run you $60 US and then 50, uh, 50 euros if you haven't already purchased that. And then finally, on the Verpal front, they announced grip stands. So for those of you like me who have multiple grips, you want somewhere to put them when you're not using them, well, what better way to store it than a nice grip stand? So these do look really solid if you've been in the market for them. They're running about $18 US or 15 euros. Um, should make it a fine addition to your desk to mount them. They have nice verbal branding on them. But I'm going to be honest. If you own a 3D printer or you have access to one, I'm going to go ahead and link to an STL file uh, here from Thingiverse that the community has already made. It's open source. It's in the show notes. Go grab this. Send it to your 3D printer. Hit print. Thank me later. It's free. It looks great. That's exclusively what I use on my desk downstairs, and I highly recommend it. So that's the free option. If you prefer to go the Verpal route, that's there for you too. Um, definitely nice to see. VKB has these. Now Verpal's got them. Win wing, waiting on you. All right. Finally, let's move over to a company called Total Controls. A little bit smaller than uh, some of the bigger, more mainstream hardware manufacturers like Verpal and Win Wing and Thrustmaster. Total Controls specializes a little more niche gear. Uh, for some of the hardware I have from them is their Apache MPDs, which are fantastic. Well, their newest creation is an ejection handle. So for those of you who really want to trick out your cockpit, that's right, you can get your very own ejection handle. So this mounts to the cockpit itself, so you can put it right behind your joystick. Has a nice silicone handle. You can pull up, initiate the joystick. It'll, it'll execute the three triggers and DCS that you need, or you can bind it to any game as you see fit to initiate that ejection. Also comes with a toggle switch with the safety cover on the side for arming of the ejection seat. Uh, the cost for this is going to be $147 US, and as the time I priced that, that puts it at about, well, should, I, let me rephrase that. It's 135 euros, and at the time I priced it, that converts to about 147 dollars US. The ship date for that is going to be February 29th, 2024. So if you're in the market for that edition, it looks like a great product. As I said, I already own some Total Controls gear, and it's very, very good. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see again on the, what the reviews think of this one. But if you're looking for that fun edition, check it out. And then finally, on the hardware news front, we got some. Troubling news from Honeycomb Aeronautical. So now this is more on the civilian side of the flight simulation market, the general aviation side. But some of their gear, I'm sure, is potentially used by those of us who fly military flight simulations. So if you're not aware, I wanted to make you aware. Now, these are the people who've created the Alpha Flight Yoke and Switch Panel and the Bravo Throttle Contract. I put my hands on both pieces of these gear, and they've been very solid. But the latest drama stems around the development of the long delayed Charlie rudder pedals. So, Nico, or Nikki, excuse me, the founder of Honeycomb, last night put out a 2,500 word statement detailing some of the issues regarding the long delays. And in particular, basically comes out and claims that his business, a relationship with a former business partner, partner can, culminated in him losing his Shopify store, 
parting ways with the said partner. Uh, it, it's a mess. I mean, there's a lot to unpack here, but there's no other way to say it than this is a complete mess. I don't really know where Honeycomb's going to go from here. So this is a story we're going to have to let breathe and see how it unpacks moving forward. Um, but suffice it to say, it, it's a shame for those people who pre-ordered these rudder pedals. Who knows if they're coming? If you if you already own Honeycomb gear, what's your what's the long term prospects of y- your warranty? Who knows? I mean, as I checked last night, the Shopify store was down, so the main website was down. I, you know, on the latest update today on the Facebook page for Honeycomb, the owner, Nikki, did commit to figuring this all out moving forward. I, I think the biggest problem for most people has been the lack of communication. I haven't followed this one too closely, but it sounds like, you know, th- there's this 2,500 word response, but there's been months and months of inactivity and radio silence on this front. And it's just a shame to see. So wanted to bring this up in case those of you who own this hardware or were interested in this hardware uh, you should go check out the story, check out the Honeycomb Facebook page, learn a little bit more, and I'll bring you some news on this one when I know more about it in the weeks to come. So that's it for hardware news. Let's shift things over to the community proof side of the house. Really uh, not track it, uh, what they're doing exactly. First up with the community news, let's talk about some campaign development. And that comes to us from Ground Pounder Sims. He just released his 2024 update to YouTube. So if you don't know Ground Pounder, uh, I own several of his DCS campaigns. He's the maker of the Harriers Kerman campaign on the Persian Gulf map, the A-10s Operation Persian Freedom, the F-18s Operation Cerberus North, and most recently, his F-16 campaign, Weasels Over Syria. So he detailed what his uh, timeline looks like for 2024. Well, I shouldn't say timeline. He details what he's hoping to work on in the months ahead. And first and foremost is he has his sequel to the F-16 Weasels Over Syria campaign, and that is Last Out Weasels Over Syria Part 2. So that's in development. I anticipate we'll probably be seeing that in the first half of this year, probably much sooner. He also hints at that he's researching and planning a Harrier campaign for the Falklands map with an early title of Falkland 14. This is going to be a second Falklands conflict taking place within his larger Ground Pounder Sims overarching storyline, and he's going to reimagine this conflict, specifically the Falcon conflict, in a more modern setting. You know, I think this is fantastic. I The Falklands map is the only map for DCS I don't own, but, you know, content like this is part of the reason I haven't owned that. So potentially, when this is released, it'll really push me to purchase that map and maybe a few others. I'm a sucker for the Harrier. It's one of my favorite modules, so anytime we can get missions for that, I'm excited. Finally, he hints that there is a third unannounced campaign in the early planning stages and that he does have intentions of an F-15 Strike Eagle campaign at some point, but that is not the third unannounced campaign. Yeah, and the F-15E, you know, I, when it releases a fantastic module, I still love to fly I think I actually have more co-piloting time in the backseat of that aircraft as a Wizzo than I do any other aircraft in DCS, despite its limited features still. Looking at you, Razbam, please, can we see more additions to that aircraft in 2024? Um, but the more content for that aircraft will be welcome as well. So anyway, links to this uh, Ground Pounders Discord and e- uh, Eagle Dynamics forum page is in the show notes. Check him out. Support his campaigns. He does some great work. Speaking of campaign developers, we got more from Baltic Dragon. He provides updates on the upcoming COLA campaign. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the COLA map is in development. It'll be taking, hopefully we'll be seeing that this year. That's probably the map I am most anticipated for. It's not Iraq. It's not Afghanistan. Give me the COLA Peninsula. Let's see some flying around Scandinavia and somewhere that does not involve sand in the desert. Thank you. But anyway, B- Baltic Dragon and Reflected Simulations are both working on campaigns for this map. So what I'm hoping we'll see is the map debuts and boom, we're going to have immediate content for it. Baltic Dragon, who's made numerous DCS campaigns, probably doesn't need an introduction from me. His campaign will be a 10-mission campaign for the Finnish Air Force of the F-18C, taking place against the backdrop of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's going to be released and share many missions with Reflected's campaign, which is going to be focused on the F-16C. So, should be fantastic. We can see those later this year. Moving away from campaign developers, but still staying uh on the DCS side of the house, to some degree, as well as BMS, is um, is TACFU. 
So TacView just received a 1.9.3 update. That's right. Everyone's favorite post-flight analysis tool just got a little bit better as I teased in the flyby. Numerous features and changes, but the biggest one I, I singled out was the addition of the DCS Sinai map. So if you fly DCS on the Sinai map and use TacView, well, things just got a whole lot better for you. Okay, shifting over to the server side of the house. Patch 2.4 for Enigma's Cold War DCS server has debuted. He's got a bunch of changes uh, to what they're planning over there on the server. If you haven't flown it, I highly encourage you to check it out. You know, multiplayer PvP is generally not my cup of tea, but the few times I've checked it out, it's it's fantastic. So anyway, what the crew and company over at Enigma's Cold War server have done is they made some changes to how the map's moving, moving forward. They've streamlined and simplified the way the map moves, and they've also introduced introduced an attrition mechanic. So think of it as like a team-wide punishment that slows the side down. So if you're never RTBing, like you're always using suicide attacks to make progress, well, the server's going to now punish you to some degree and slow down your progress. So that should be interesting to see how it plays out. They've also made some changes to recon. So once recon units are dropped, a JTAC is now going to spawn and will lay as a target continuously. Uh, once that unit is destroyed that's being lasered, JTAC's going to switch to another one uh, that it found on in the initial recon. And so you'll have that there as a reference or uh, to utilize if you're trying to do some strikes of your own. Uh, finally, lasing is going to be accomplished with smoke, both visually, and then they'll also have a laser present with the codes available on the F10 map. The JTAC will stay on station for about 30 minutes. And they're also going to introduce a system called Credit Collins. So this is going to be a way for players to use their credits to spawn in friendly assets. So think of it as a recon asset, a seed asset, an AWACS asset, or even repair of friendly facilities. The AWACS in particular is going to be something that's really useful as Enigma hinted that early warning radar coverage is going to be changed to be very limited on the server. So only friendly territory is going to be covered by AWACS initially. So if you want to have AWACS support beyond the front lines, that's where these credit call-ins are going to come into play. And then finally, a couple of quality of life cheat tails they changed. Uh, the EWR bot format is now easier to use. And then airfields will remain owned by a side that owns the hex. So no more enemy infantry just suddenly flipping an airfield without flipping the zone. If you own the zone, you own the airfield. So that wraps things up for this DCS server update for Enigma Cold War. And it wraps up the community news in general. So uh, let's go ahead and transition to the spotlight portion of the show. Where we're going to highlight the work of people just like you. The community. First up, we got user content of the week. So sometimes it's going to be a mission, sometimes it's a tutorial, sometimes it's just something interesting that you guys brought up as a topic of conversation. That's the user content of the week. We got two pieces of content this week, so a double bonus. The first up is sandbox campaigns. So I found this Reddit post on Hogget this week asking, what is the best World War II single player sandbox missions? Um, this is a topic that I'm always interested in. I personally love sandbox missions. I think they're a fantastic way to get familiar with an aircraft. Or if you just have a, a limited amount of time to kill, you just want to fire up a mission, have stuff going on, dig right into it. So I linked on the blog notes a couple of the recommendations that I thought were pretty interesting and I'm looking forward to checking out this week. Specifically as it relates to World War II was the Simple Channel Sandbox version 1.0. So that's on the DCS user file page. And then the other was Squeaky's Training Day. So uh, Squeaky, a major contributor to the DCS user files out there, has sandboxes for every map that you could want to play in DCS. So Persian Gulf, Caucasus, Syria, Sinai, Nevada, Mariana, South Atlantic, and soon to be the World War II sandboxes, hopefully by the end of this week. He introduces his sandbox as a means to serve as a casual and simple open training box sanding missions, as I mentioned, to brush up on skills when you're returning to a module or to practice in between training missions and multiplayer or campaigns, if that's your cup of tea too. So you hop right in, it's an open mission, you got static and ambient units to make the game world feel more immersive. There's no threats as you're flying around unless you provoke them or initiate some combat. And there's only one file. So you download the file for the map, fire it up, boom, you got hot spawns, cold, hot starts, cold starts, aircraft for every aircraft in the game that you can fly you can get several waypoints and ranges to choose from so you can do ground attack anti-ship anti-air seed deed you name it you got it 
Plus, they're beyond just the aircraft of the runways, there's also naval assets as well. So you got the super carrier, the HSM, HMS Invincible and the Tarawa. Tankers are available, AWACS are available. Long story short, if, if you could want it in a DCS mission, it's there for you. Go ahead, check out uh, what Squeaky's gone ahead and made for you. Let me know what you think. Provide some feedback. I Like I said, I love sandbox, sandbox missions. I think they're the way to go if you want to get started with an aircraft. So let me know. Do you guys have any favorites? What are your some of your favorite go-to missions, uh, or specifically as they relate to sandbox and DCS? All right, the second main piece of contact Con user content for this week is the F-14 Rio Cold Start and Radar Training Mission by Nobdi. So uh, this is one area of the game I don't really see getting a lot of focus, the poor backseat drivers, right? So I, if you don't have someone to reliably play with in the F-14 or fly with, how do you get better at the Rio? Well, that's what this user is trying to solve with their little mission. So the scope of this mission is A, helping you set up your Rio and radar keybinds, and B, understanding some general radar employment procedures. So the goal is to ensure you're not lost when you join someone in multiplayer for the first time. So the, the basic premise of the mission is you, you have a cold start with a scripted catapult launch and air start versions as well. So if you want to skip the ground start, the super carrier is required for this, but he has a wonderful video walkthrough of what you can expect. I know I've been wanting to learn more about the Rio seat in the F-14. This is something I'm looking into. If you have alternative tutorials specifically as it relates to in-game content where people can go practice on how to get better at the F-14 Rio, let me know. I'll add it to the blog and we'll touch on it in a future episode. All right, so that's it for the user content. Now let's go over to my favorite uh, segment of the show, and that's the Sim Pit Spotlight. You don't see any big stream, but flames or smoke coming out there. So the Sim Pit Spotlight is where we highlight someone's personal Sim Pit setup so that we can get ideas for our own setup or just give us something to drool over while we're sitting staring at our desk every day. So the, the spotlight this week goes on Bart is here. So Bart is here as a star citizen streamer on Twitch, found this on Twitter. And what really he said about doing that, I think is really uh, pretty impressive is it really tapped in some of that overhead space. So essentially he has an existing cockpit built out of extruded aluminum and he had some extra mounts and bars set up. So he had a, two verbal panels, and rather than put, put them beside his cockpit on either side, left or right, he said, you know what, why don't I turn this into an overhead dashboard and mount it above me? So he essentially used a big piece of aluminum coming up behind his chair and put it over his head, and boom. Two control panels right above his head, easy to reach, flip his switches, manipulates dials. It just looks terrific. So go ahead, check out the show notes. Give him a follow on Twitter. It's at BartIsHere87. Made this post on January 15th. Really, really looks cool. Uh, impressive dude. Keep up the great work, Bart. And if you have some ideas of what we should highlight on future Sim Pit segment setups, be sure to email us at the show at feedback at thehangerbaypod.com. So this is the point of the show where we normally go to listener feedback. 612, departure radio check. But since it's the inaugural episode, we don't have any listener feedback. So I guess this is the point in the show where I'm going to start asking you, is there segments you think I'm missing? Would you like me to feature interviews with developers, content creators, community members in the future? What pieces of news did I miss that you think I should talk about next week? Would you guys like to hear reviews on the shows in the future of any hardware, modules, campaigns, the like? Let me know what you'd like to hear. I'd love to feature stuff that you're interested in as well as what I'm interested in. Having said all that, that's the first episode. So thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of The Hangar Bay. We're going to be back next Saturday to get you squared away with all the latest military flight simulation and hardware news. As this show is a celebration of people like you, the community, please don't hesitate to reach out with feedback, news, or suggestions for future spotlights, as I was just saying. But until then, think about what you put out into the community and make it a better place. Fly safe, everyone. Down low, out of decks. Unload 500 Let's get out of here. The missile knows where it is at all times. Oh, I'm sorry. What I meant to say is that you can find the video show on YouTube or on Spotify at the Hangar Bay Pod. The audio show is available on all major podcast providers. You can contact the show via email, feedback at the Hangar Bay Pod.com, or on Instagram and Twitter at the Hangar Bay Pod. Show notes and links to everything discussed on this week's show are available at thehangerbaypod.com.